speaker this evening is Nancy Futzenreuter, who has collected quilts for over 20 years. She chooses the quilts because of their workmanship, the fabrics, the colors, the patterns used, their general condition, and their history and age. Nancy always says about quilts, the older the better. This exceptional exhibit focuses on three distinct quilt traditions within her collection, the Amish and Mennonite designs, the classic applique designs, and the unique and unusual quilts. Nancy will speak about her passion and her collection. Please welcome Nancy Putzenreuter to the podium. Uh, I would like to thank the Hoover Museum and Tim Walsh for being interested in showing this quilt collection. I would also like to thank Maureen Harding who's worked so hard with me and uh, curated this exhibit. She's been great. I consider quilts a form of art. Quilts contain design elements, sewing techniques, and workmanship. I have been collecting antique quilts for the past 30 years. My husband and I enjoy going to antique shows and antique stores, either locally or on our travels. I am not an expert on quilts, I just like collecting them. <coughs> when I look at a quilt, I look at the design, the quilting, the colors, and the overall condition of a quilt. I will be showing you photographs of some of these quilts later in this talk. Our quilts are stored in bookcases and display cases in our home. Some are kept in blanket chests. I do have a few quilts that are recently made that I use as bed covers. <coughs> the antique quilts are not used on the beds or hung on the walls to prevent wear and tear. Since quilts are made of fabric, some are too fragile to hang without causing damage to them. Regular sunlight can also fade the colors of the fabric. I do like and collect other textiles. I have a number of Hmong textiles. The Hmong people are from northern Laos. There was a large immigration of Hmong in the 1970s after the Vietnam War to the United States. We have found these textiles in Chicago, North Carolina, Minneapolis, and even New Mexico. The embroidery sometimes is in geometric patterns. Sometimes the embroidery will tell a story of village life or village history. We also collect antique Navajo weavings and Rio Grande Spanish weavings from New Mexico and the Four Corners area. I look at the tightness in the weaving, the colors and the dyes used, and the design when choosing one of these weavings. This one dates from the 1800s. I have collected a few antique jacquard weavings over the years. This is a close-up of a coverlet made at a weaving company in Fairfield, Iowa. At the bottom of this photo woven into the weaving is the name Stevenson Company, Fairfield, Iowa, 1852. I don't collect too many of this type of weaving, but I like the pattern and the colors and the Iowa connection. Getting back to quilts again, while this looks like a terrible picture, it shows the back side of a quilt. Sometimes the back of a quilt is as interesting as the front of the quilt. Old quilts were made with cotton batting between the quilt top and the quilt back. The dark spots in the photo show the cotton seed debris in the batting. And that would be these spots. And down here. One way to uh, date a quilt is by seeing the uh, cotton seed debris inside the quilt when you hold it up to light. Fabric is another way to date quilts. The back of the quilt can also sometimes show off the quilting better. This shows feather quilting and cross stitch quilting. And this is the cross stitch and then the feather comes around like this. Tight and even stitching is another thing I look for in a quilt. This is a close-up of another quilt to highlight the quilting. This piece has trapunto quilting. Trapunto quilting adds texture to a quilt by stuffing or filling an area, then stitching around it. This produces a raised pattern. 
This quill has raised flowers, leaves, grapes, and ribbons. This quilt exhibit at the Hoover Museum includes large size quilts. Most are the size that would fit a queen or a king size bed. I also collect crib size quilts. The next seven photos will show some of the crib quilt collection. Most are Amish from the 1930s to 1940s. And we also brought you the crib quilts to show you their actual size. This is not an Amish, it's a white work crib quilt with trapuntal quilting from the 1800s. The trapuntal quilting is a feathered vine again. It also has tight, closely spaced, and even stitching in the rest of the quilt. This really shows off the talent of the seamstress. When I look at a quilt, I always look at the quilting, not just the design pattern. I prefer hand-sewn, not machine-sewn quilts. This quilt design is called Delectable Mountains from Holmes County, Ohio. Over the years, we have found quilts at antique stores and shows and through antique dealers. A large number of our Amish quilts were found at the Wooden Wheel store in Kelowna, Iowa. This is where we started collecting Amish quilts. We also found a number of Amish quilts from a dealer in Ohio and one in Evanston, Illinois. And this is one of the quilts we found in Kelowna. This quilt is a very nice Amish schoolhouse design from the 1930s. This design is difficult to find in an Amish quilt as, as it's not a typical Amish design. I have another large size Amish schoolhouse quilt in this Coover exhibit today. The larger schoolhouse quilt has been exhibited in Tokyo. The Tokyo exhibit was curated by another dealer that we know from Louisville, Kentucky. This quilt design is called a railroad crossing dated between 1930 and 1940 from Holmes County, Ohio. Holmes County has one of the largest Amish communities in the United States. Millersburg, Ohio is their county seat. This design is a variation of birds in flight dated in the 1930s also from Holmes County. Triangles are challenging to piece together. It is difficult to stitch the triangles together accurately. If one triangle is off, then the rest of the triangle design will be irregular. This quilt also shows a scallop quilting around the borders. This is a pinwheel star design also made in the 1930s and 1940s. The double red border with the black border is desirable because it frames the design of the quilt. Even though there are only two colors in this quilt, the red and the black, the design is simple and the quilt makes a very bold statement. This is what I consider the beauty of Amish quilts, their simplicity and their boldness. This design is called Chinese Coins with Triangles, made in the 1940s from Hutchinson, Kansas. There's a large Amish community near Hutchinson. The coins appear to be stacked on their sides. I also have a side collection of quilt reference books that I use and have acquired over the years while collecting quilts. I use these books to look up information about quilts I have and about quilts I would like to find. And that's all the crib quilts we brought for today. We did bring some gloves for anybody who would like to come up after this to look at the quilts up close. The gloves are so you can handle the quilts without getting dirt or oils from your hands on them. The next few photos are some examples of other quilts we have that are not in this exhibit at the Hoover. This quilt top is made of old cigar bands we bought from an antique dealer in Massachusetts dated 1880 to 1900. Cigars were wrapped in bundles of silk ribbons that had a brand name printed on them. Most cigar band quilts are made in a variation of a log cabin design similar to this one. This is a close-up of the cigar band quilt. Some of the names on it are Wall Street, Arteti, Pack Horse, Neptune, Horseshoe Fall, 
Lady Smith, and Ben Hur. The cigar bands are cut straight but sewn together with a decorative zigzag stitch. Unusual and non-traditional quilts are also interesting for me to collect. There are a few more non-traditional quilts that we've collected in the Hoover exhibit here. This is a piece triangles design from the 1880s with the red sashing that we found in Santa Fe, New Mexico. This quilt has the yellow gold color called cheddar. Some people collect quilts with the cheddar color. The triangle piecing is very nicely done and the red sashing helps the design stand out. This quilt design is called Storm at Sea and is made in the 1920s. It has a very nice optical design with the Wedgwood blue and white. This design almost seems like modern art with all the motion in the design. I found this quilt in an antique shop here in West Branch a few years back. This is a feathered star design with a chintz border from the 1840s to 1850s. Chintz is a cotton material printed with flowers, birds, and other designs. It is difficult to see in this picture, but this quilt has beautiful quilting around the design and the border. So again, it's not just the design I look at, but also how much and how detailed the quilting is in the quilt. This quilt is a log cabin courthouse step design from the 1880s that was made in Marshalltown, Iowa. It's made out of silk and velvet material which wears out faster over time than cotton. One of the things I look for in a quilt is the overall condition of the quilt. If there's a lot of wear and tear or staining, I usually don't purchase that quilt. This quilt has minimal wear and tear of the silk and the velvet material. This quilt design is called a Dutch Rose or Stars and Cubes made in 1860 from New England that I found in an antique store in Cedar Rapids. Quilt designs can have more than one name. Sometimes part of one design is used with part of another design to produce a variation or even an original design. I always find it interesting to see what different designs and what different fabrics are used in a quilt. This quilt design is called Turkey Tracks, made in the 1850s from Pennsylvania. Red and green quilts are very popular. Sometimes a simple quilt design is very effective. Oftentimes a simple design is coupled with elaborate quilting stitches. This quilt has extensive quilt stitching of wreaths, ropes, double lines, feathering, scallops, and cross hatching between the turkey tracks. This quilt design is called Wreath of Roses, made in 1854. Some quilt designs are more intricate. I have found some quilts just grab me instantly, and this is one of them. The design and colors are beautiful. It has a great border. The quilting is extensive, even with the intricate design, and the overall condition is excellent. This same quilt is also autographed and dated by the seamstress, Mary M. Strickler, dated in 1854 in ink. Some quilt makers sign their quilts in ink. I have other quilts that have initials and dates stitched into the quilting of the quilts also. This quilt is a good example of an applique quilt. The applique quilts have layers of fabric stitched on top of each other to make the design. And this photo shows the layering and the stitching around the layers. This is an Amish quilt with a design called a bear paw variation with a double border from LaGrange, Indiana. There's a large Amish community in the LaGrange area. This photograph shows our semi-professional photography studio in our house, toes and all underneath the quilt. <laughs> I am also going to give credit to my daughter Katrina for helping me with this PowerPoint. One of the questions I get asked often is if I sew. And the answer is no. I've tried to sew one or two quilts and lack the talent and the patience to do it well. My sister Judy sews and has made a number of quilts and table runners for me. And this is one she's made for me. It's machine sewn, hand embroidered, and a very nice sunbonnet sew design. 
My sister-in-law Cleta also quilts and she made this quilt. It's hand sewn and hand quilted. It's an older design called an Irish chain. She also weaves and tats lace. So although I do not quilt, I do appreciate all the time and effort that goes into making a quilt. So to finish, when I choose a quilt, I look at design, color, workmanship, and overall condition. I gravitate toward quilts made in the 1800s and early 1900s, but also appreciate contemporary quilts. I can't say I have a favorite quilt until I see the next one, and then that's my favorite. <laughs> I just enjoy collecting quilts and sharing them with other people. Thank you. For thousands of years, Asians and Europeans had sewn layered fabrics together for warmth, insulation, and even the cushioning of armor. Why, then, is quilting considered a distinctly American art form? Beginning in the 18th century and continuing to the present day, the basic bed cover evolved into paintings on fabric filled with special flourishes and geometric designs. For this exhibit, quilt collector Nancy Futzenreuter has selected 24 of her favorites, dating from 1850 to 1940. Over 20 years ago, she received her first quilt from her husband, and has been collecting ever since. Although Nancy does not quilt herself, she appreciates the creativity and skill of quilters who combine fabric and thread into exquisite bed covers. Three distinct quilt traditions are featured in this exhibit. Amish and Mennonite patterns, classic applique designs, and the unique and unusual. What was once seen as a fabric sandwich Unique and unusual quilts are considered contemporary works of art. Creative quilters often experimented with traditional designs or original representations to create exceptional works of art. For this exhibit, Nancy has chosen six unique quilts that range from original crazy quilt designs to a narrow hired man's quilt to those with a commemorative or patriotic theme. Many themes from architecture have inspired quilters, including stained glass window designs in churches and homes as reflected in this stained glass window quilt from the 1870s. The border's dark separation and the quilt's white separation represent the leading that frames the glass pieces in stained glass windows. Each block permits a small, freeform composition. Quilts pieced of elements with curved edges can sometimes require more skill than those with straight edges. This quilt, dating to 1880, was created from advertising bandanas that were produced for the Humpty Dumpty Circus, first appearing at Olympic Theater in New York City in 1868. The circus toured the country until 1886. Fabric advertising was common in the late 1800s and commemorated significant historic events, political campaigns, prize ribbons, and souvenirs. This quilt, made between 1860 and 1880, is called a hired man's size because of its dimensions that are made to fit narrow beds, often intended for itinerant farm workers. This particular quilt is unusual and rare because such quilts rarely survive the wear and tear. The nine patch within nine patch is reversible to a pineapple log cabin pattern. The nine patch pattern is a simple square equally divided into nine equal parts. The pineapple log cabin quilt design is a variation of the log cabin design, among the most popular and easy recognized quilt pattern. Eagles appeared on quilts when the eagle was adopted as America's national symbol. It continued to be popular through the 1840s. The northern states brought this motif back into fashion again after the Civil War. This quilt was made in the mid-1800s in Pennsylvania and features four wonderfully styled eagles. The triangles quilt from the late 1880s is unusual due to the 8,000 pieces that make up this bed cover. If the measurement of one edge of the piece is not perfectly aligned, the plan of the entire quilt top could be in jeopardy. This was clearly very time-consuming and the workmanship is very complex, incorporating old and interesting fabrics. The 1933 World's Fair celebrated the centennial of Chicago's incorporation. 
For this event, Sears and Roebuck sponsored a nationwide quilt contest with a grand prize of $1,000, equivalent to about $15,000 in today's market. After 27,000 entries were judged in local contests, winning entries were sent on to regional contests. Three winners from each of 10 regions were selected to exhibit at the Sears Pavilion. The 30 quilts ranged from traditional designs to original creations reflecting the theme of progress like this one. This quilt is one of Nancy Futzenreuter's favorites and was made by a winning entrant from Indiana. In 1536, Dutchman Menno Simons formed the Mennonites, a group within the Anabaptists, reformers who believed in salvation through faith in Jesus Christ, rejected infant baptism, and practiced nonviolence. Their contrary beliefs led to persecution by the Roman Catholic Church, so they fled to Switzerland. The Mennonites live very simply with plain clothing and reject material wealth. Feeling the Mennonites had become undisciplined, Jacob Amman and his followers, the Amish, split off from the Mennonites in 1693. Both groups began to emigrate to the New World in the 1700s. Even in America, additional discord led to further splits. Today, approximately 200,000 Amish and Mennonites live in 20 states. For this exhibit, Nancy selected 10 Amish and Mennonite quilts. Pennsylvania Amish quilts feature straight edges of rectangles, squares, triangles, and diamonds. In this Mennonite example from 1880, pine trees are represented with a clever combination of diamonds, rectangles, and triangles. This variation of log cabin quilt design is constructed of numerous fabric strips. In this courthouse layout dating to 1880, strips are sewn top to bottom instead of around and around the center. The heyday of the log cabin quilt was in the third and fourth quarters of the 19th century, corresponding to the westward pioneer migration after the Civil War. America's earliest dated log cabin quilt was made in 1869, but this pattern was found in Britain as early as 1825. This tumbling blocks pattern, made between 1930 and 1940, repeats design elements to form a graphically stunning quilt, reminiscent of modern op art. Another name for this traditional American pattern is baby blocks. This 1930 quilt has the Amish strip star or spider star pattern. The term strip quilts refers to a number of designs where the quilter used narrow strips of fabric to piece the triangles and diamonds in other shapes that make up the quilt blocks. Scrappy style quilts were popular during the Depression when quilters chose to use up all of their fabric scraps because there was little extra money available to purchase new material. Another name for this pattern is cobweb and stars. Baskets have been used in hundreds of quilt patterns and often contain detailed floral arrangements. This 1940 Carolina lily pattern is a charming favorite for many quilters. Other names and variations include lily, daylily, meadow lily, or even peony. The flowers are nearly always in groups of three. This quilt is possibly from the Midwest rather than Pennsylvania because of its traditional American design and bold use of black fabric. The schoolhouse is an extremely rare pattern for Amish quilt because objects were not usually represented on an Amish bed cover. Like the Amish Carolina lily basket design, this quilt dating between 1935 and 1945 may have been made in the Midwest rather than Pennsylvania because of its traditional American design of the schoolhouse. Of course, there are always exceptions. This Thousand Pyramids quilt from 1930 to 1940 is an excellent example of what can be accomplished from a single shape, a triangle. The more acute the angle, the more difficult the piecing of the pattern. Note the small size of the triangles, which adds to the difficulty, yet showcases the skills of the quilter. This small quilt, also dating from 1930 to 1940, is considered a hired man's size. The nine patch pattern is a simple square equally divided into nine equal parts. In this example, the squares become diamonds when placed on point. This is a popular Amish and Mennonite pattern that creates fascinating rhythm with simple shapes. But why the pattern name of Chinese coins, which are round? One suggestion on an internet blog seems plausible. 
Ancient Chinese coins often had a square hole in the center, making it easy to stack the coins and carry around on a stick. When a stack of coins is viewed from the side, the shape becomes a rectangle. Triangles are popular shapes within an untold variety of quilt patterns, including baskets, pine trees, and ocean waves. The color and placement of the triangles offer nearly hypnotic effect of the movement, just like ocean waves. An applique quilt is made up of cutting, layering, and stitching of small pieces of fabric on top of larger ones. The pieces do not have to fit together and are not usually geometric in design. Pictorial elements often create a theme, such as flowers, bows, swags, birds, people, or animals. Quilt tops are often designed in blocks of four or more, separated by bands called sashing, sets, or frames. Applique quilts are often combined with piecing of fabric. On pieced quilts, the stitching follows the fabric shapes. For those that are also applique, the quilt tops become a virtual canvas for needlework artists because the design requires very detailed stitching. Numerous antique applique quilts are still in existence. One reason for this is because they were often considered the very best quilts and only brought out for company. Here are eight applique quilts from Nancy's collection. Berry, leaf, and vine patterns are a recurring design in antique quilts. The colors of white, green, red, as seen in this poinsettia and currants pattern made around 1850, are also a traditional favorite. This quilt was signed by Catherine Borst and dated March 11, 1853. The Mariner's Compass pattern echoes a seafaring guide called a compass rose, or the older wind rose that was used on sailing charts dating back to the Middle Ages. This navigational design depicts the orientation of north, south, east, and west. More points were developed to gain more precise bearings until the design encompassed 32 points. This quilt pattern usually has 16 or 32 points. The first known quilt to use the Mariner's Compass pattern was made in 1726 in England. The feathered star pattern is also a best quilt and saved for special occasions because the pattern requires advanced sewing skills. Note the beautiful quilting swirls on the white ground enhanced even further by the stark contrast of the pattern of this quilt from 1855. There are hundreds of flower quilt patterns. Some of the most popular patterns feature roses, peonies, lilies, and tulips. This flowers and buds quilt was made around 1855. This tulip quilt was signed by Nancy Strickler and dated April 1855. Tulips are said to represent love and were a popular design motif, especially in the 19th century. Using an organic motif traditionally known as oak leaf, this oak leaf and vine quilt made around 1860 may be a variation on an antique pattern called oak leaf and reel, which dates back to the late 1700s. This New York beauty quilt made around 1870 is a traditional favorite which utilizes a complex pattern. This demanding block, like its sister, the Mariner's Compass, presents difficulties in construction because of the precise matching of points. Roses of all shapes and sizes are found in popular patterns. In this case, American Beauty represents a hybrid perpetual rose, bred in France in 1875 and introduced in the United States that same year. This American Beauty rose design was made around 1920 from a Marie Webster pattern. This concludes our program, Patterns of the Past, a Century of American Quilting, from the collections of Nancy Futzenreiter. Thank you for watching.